signal. But you can also have another approach, a fully analog one. And this is very interesting to understand what happens if you use a fully analog mode. First thing, why uh, it is useful not to use the digital approach of the double beam interferometer, in your opinion. What is the real difference between this scheme and the double beam interferometer that we have seen? The big difference is that now we are working with a speckled pattern distribution. With the double beam interferometer, we were working with a corner cube. Okay? So, as I said, when we work with the speckled pattern uh, distribution, we want to limit, let's say, the movement of the target. Okay? Because, again, remember that we always have to face this noise equivalent displacement that is related to, let's say, uh, in this case, this is ST, divided by the longitudinal dimension of the spectrum. Okay? So we always want to keep this value lower, much lower than the longitudinal dimension of the spectrum. So, in a way, if you work with the double beam interferometric, double beam interferometer approach, you know that you have a resolution that is more or less close to 80 nanometer, okay? But it's hugely probable that you want to measure vibrations that are lower than 80 nanometers of amplitude, okay? So, uh, you have to find out another way to use this instrument, okay? And in particular, if you use an analog approach, you don't have digitalization of measurement because you are not doing, you're not doing a, uh, let's say, counting measurement. And so you can go deeply down to the real limits of measurement, okay? So this is the idea behind the use of a full analog approach, okay? In particular, uh, what you do is to multiply, for example, the uh, cosine of the optical phase by the derivative of the cosine of the optical phase, okay? If you do this measurement, what you get is 2K, let's say ds over the T multiplied by cos uh, 2KS, uh, sorry, oh, there is a, sorry, you multiply the cosine by, yes, in fact, sorry. You do the cross multiplication, so you divide sin 2ks, okay, this is, this is correct. So you have a minus here, because you have, you have plus here, okay, perfect, 2k, S multiplied by cos 2KS, okay? And the other term is you multiply the sin, or let's say the term that is related to the frequency modulation of the beam, of the optical beam, multiplied by the derivative of the amplitude modulation, or cos 2KS, divided by T, this is given by minus 2k uh, ds over the t multiplied by sin squared, the square value of sin 2ks. Okay? Then now, if you use this quantity and you subtract to this quantity the other one, this is what happened here in this amplifier, so you have deriv a derivation, then you have multiplication, and then here you have subtraction, what you get?
you get that at the output of f you have uh, 2k ds divided by t multiplied by cos squared of 2ks plus sin squared of 2ks and so this is equal to 2k ds over the t and takes into account that ds over the t is the signal velocity of displacement of displacement of the mirror of the moving mirror okay then to obtain the displacement the real displacement you just have to integrate the signal and then you have a replica an exact replica of displacement of the displacement of the target okay so this is the good point you have both velocity it's saying with the same setup, you have both velocity and displacement of the object. Okay? So let's say, in a way, you are forced to try another solution because you're working with the aspect of pattern distribution. So you know that the resolution of 80 nanometer that is given by the digital approach of the double beam interferometer is probably not useful in this case. But what you gain with the this new approach, with this new approach you gain that you have two information on movement of the target. The movement, that is the S, and also the velocity. And in particular this setup was used to uh, characterize loudspeaker. In particular what you see, you see <coughs> this is the carrier without, so the signal at uh, 100 kilohertz. This is the carrier without cell mixing. Okay? So without the loudspeaker. And this is the same signal with the cell mixing happening onto the second mode. Okay? So you see here you see the frequency modulation and here you see on a different scale, timing scale, here you see the uh, amplitude modulation. Okay? Of course, you, if you don't have uh, the cell mixing phenomenon, you see, you have not you. What you see is that you don't have change of the frequency of the carrier, and you don't have change in the amplitude of the carrier. Okay. Then you, what you get, you get the cosine and sin that are related to the frequency modulation and to the amplitude modulation of the signal. And ST is the signal with which you drive the loudspeaker, okay? So this is what you use externally, and this is what you are reconstructing. Now, the point is, this signal is a bit different from this one. There is an error or not. And as you can see, since this approach is fully analog, you reconstruct fully the signal, or better, you can start all the signal, okay? This is important. And now, since you see this uh, little oscillation, this is the velocity signal, and this is uh, the displacement signal. In your opinion, this, let's say, oscillation, you see in the velocity, and you see in the displacement signal, are an error or not? Or they related to something else? Remember that you are trying to drive a loudspeaker. Okay, so a loudspeaker is something that has a mass that changes its position because there is a coil in which you have current, and then the, uh, the passage of current, since this is alternated current, moves this, ma this magnet, and then you have the mechanical wave. Okay? So you are trying to move this magnet with this signal. In your opinion, what happens when you try to change instantaneously the direction of motion of uh, this mass. You have this ringing, okay? So this is a real characterization of what happens uh, into the loudspeaker, okay? So these are not error. This is the characterization of the loudspeaker, okay? And so you see that with a, let's say, very simple setup because uh, 
With respect to what we have seen, we don't have the reference mirror, we don't have the reference field, okay? Uh, we have just, okay, I key me stabilize the Zima laser, we have just the target, and then you, we have the electronic, so the setup is very, let's say, simple, okay? And you have built up an instrument that works, okay? And that is able to give you a fully analog measurement of displacement and velocity of your target, okay? Mm -hmm. The technology is against me. Yeah. Sorry, what is the time? Uh, 49. 49. 49. Minutes to 10. Okay. Okay, now, uh, we can try to understand uh, if we can, in a way, extend the uh, source range using also laser diode, okay? So what is the huge difference between laser diode and uh, other kind of laser? That laser diode comes with a very large uh, angle of emission, okay? So if you want to use a, a laser diode, you have to use a focusing lens to focus light onto the target, okay? And uh, since the reflectivity of the actual mirror is uh, very lower, okay, than the one that you can find, for example, in a Heaney laser, you must control the amount of uh, electric field that is allowed to re-enter the cavity, okay? So if, for this, you have to insert in the cavity a variable attenuator to diminish, to diminish the value of the field that, is, that can go inside the cavity, okay? So these are the two differences. So with respect to a Heaney laser, you have to add the focusing lens and the variable attenuator. But what you gain, let's say, if you use a laser diode in the, let's say, 90% of situation, inside the package with which you, in which you buy the laser diode, you also find the monitor photodiode, okay? So the photodiode, you don't have to use an external photodiode, okay, to analyze light. So this is a, an advantage. And this is true in general because laser diodes are very compact, let's say relatively cheap with respect to other sources, very efficient and very powerful used because the uh, gain of the medium is very high with respect, for example, to that of Heaney laser. And as I said, usually they come with a monitor photodiode installed in, it, in them. But we have a bit of problem with respect, for example, to the Heaney laser that we have just seen. For example, it's not possible to force a single longitudinal la uh, laser diode to work onto two or ternary polarized mode by way, by means of, a, let's say, Zeeman or similar effect, okay? You cannot do this. There is another problem. The phase noise of the uh, laser or the width, the length width of a laser diode is much larger than the width of a Heaney laser. So it is not possible to <coughs> obtain the frequency modulation related to the cell mixing effect, even if you have an external oscillator by which you can down convert, let's say, the amplitude and frequency modulation to an electrical or manageable frequency, okay? So you are uh, left, let's say, with just the amplitude modulation. And this, as you already know, the, uh, brings the problem of ambiguity, of detection of movement of the target, okay? So let's see if we can overcome this problem. Uh, okay, I will probably finish the slide next time, okay? So don't worry. And don't worry also for these formulas. This is just to give you the idea. I probably you already know uh, this term. If you cancel out this one, if you cancel out this one, these are the rate equation of function of laser. Okay, because you have the rate of change of field, phase, and uh, population inversion or, ca or carrier in this case. Okay, so these are the usual equation that you have already seen. Uh, Lade Kobayashi studied the phenomenon of the back injection. So they say, okay, we have the laser cavity, and then we have the external cavity. Okay, in particular, 
what is important for the laser cavity? This is the lifetime of photons, electrons, and the, let's say, round trip time uh, inside the cavity. And then you have an external cavity, let's say at a distance, a particular distance at zero from the output mirror. Then you have the round trip time of, uh, and let's say this is the time the light imply to go from the source to the target and then back to the, to the laser, okay? And then you have a particular parameter, epsilon, that is called the back injection parameter, okay? If you start and they have understood that you can completely characterize this situation just adding these two terms, okay? One to the, let's say, rate of change of the field and the other one to the rate of change of the phase, okay? These two terms are uh, one proportional to the cosine of the optical phase. We have already seen this. And the other one is proportional to the seam of this optical phase. Okay? This is important because if you start from this equation, what you get is that if you look at the photodetected current, you have a situation that is very similar to what you have, to what you have just seen. You have a mean value. And then you have 1 plus an M. M is an index of modulation. Let's say this M is close to the fringe's visibility that we have already seen. Then you have a particular function of the optical phase. In particular, this function is a two-periodic function of the optical phase, and it is limited between minus 1 and 1. Okay? Uh, in particular, if... Uh, the function f has the shape or behave like a cosine function, you are exactly in the same condition that we have seen before, because we have that the photodetected current is equal to a 0, 1 plus m cosine 2ks. This is exactly what we have already seen. Okay? But with a semiconductor laser, uh, something changes because, in, in, uh, to be honest, the shape of this function depends on a particular parameter that is called the C parameter that depends, again, on to the back injection parameter. And uh, what you see here are very simple parameters because you have the reflectivity of the target or the external mirror, okay? the reflectivity of the output mirror of the laser, then you have the distance at rest of the target, then you have the optical length of the laser cavity, and then you have another parameter that is the line with it and ascent factor, okay? This term is zero for a HIMI laser, and it is between one, seven, six into a semiconductor laser, for a semiconductor laser, okay? So, this is what I say. In particular, if you try to understand what is the possible values of this parameter C, uh, okay, this is what I have just said. If you make a comparison between Heaney laser and laser diode, you see that the with the maximum factor is zero in this case, and it is different from zero in this case. The reflectivity of the output mirror of the laser is very large, very high in he with the any laser and very low with semiconductor laser. The dimension of the laser, and so let's say the optical length of the cavity is larger for any laser than for laser diode. Okay. For all this consideration, it is definitely easier to work with higher value of the parameter C if you maintain constant, let's say, external properties. External properties are, for example, the distance of the target from the laser and, for example, the reflectivity of the target. Okay. I started five minutes later, so I will go on until 10.5, okay? Because this is important. This is uh, uh, everything that you must know when you try to do self-mixing interferometry with uh, Laser, with the laser diode, okay? In particular, you can 
define, let's say, four possible regimes of operation in function of the values of the C parameter. The very weak rate injection is when C is comprised between 0 and 0 0.1. The function F is more or less a cosine function. This is what we have seen until now. So this is the HEMI working condition. It is very, very difficult because of what we have just seen to work with a HEMI laser in a condition in which C is larger than 0 0.1. And so what you use? You use the cosine function. But then when you start to increase the value of C, this function try to start to be distorted. And in particular, if you go up of C equal to 1, you have a multi-valued function. Okay? This is strange because, of course, you know that a real function cannot mathematically cannot be multi-valued. Okay? So what happens in reality? If we are able to work with uh, uh, sufficient, let's say, feedback or sufficient, sufficient uh, re-injection into the laser cavity, we can work here, for example, in the third uh, possible regime of operation, that is the moderate one, in which you have uh, this situation. Let's suppose that uh, we want to move far away from the uh, laser. Okay, so the, the optical phase is increasing. So we follow the blue curve, but the blue curve is particular because we're going until here, then you have a jump, a negative jump of the signal, then we follow the function half until this point, then we have again another jump, negative one, this is very important, and then we continue in this way. If we increase the phase, this is what happens. We have jump for each 2 pi phase variation. This is very important, okay? Then, okay, let's suppose that we are coming back toward the source. Now, what you follow is still the, fu the function f, but then the jump are, first of all, positive. And they, of course, here. You have a positive jump, then you have another one, and again, the phase difference between this jump is, again, equal to 2 pi, okay? Since the optical phase is still equal to 2ks, you have to remember that a 2 pi phase variation means a movement of the target of lambda over 2. This is still true, okay? So each jump occurs for a displacement of lambda over 2. And these are real, uh, let's say, uh, oscilloscope images of what happens uh, onto the photodetector current, photodetected current, okay? So just looking at the amplitude of the signal, if you work with a value of the C parameter that is higher than one, you see this particular shape that is, of course, completely different from a cosine function, but it is very useful because here you have positive jump if you are coming back toward the laser, and you have negative jump if you're moving away from the laser. So, in particular, if you do the derivative of this signal, you have, let's say, pulses, and each pulse means that the object has moved of lambda over 2 farther or closer to the instrument. Okay. And again, so if we are able to work with this so to so to shape of the function, so with c higher than one, we are able to overcome the ambiguity problem, and so we have built up another interferometer that now is not limited. Well, if it, if you work with a speckle pattern, it is limited by the speckle pattern distribution. But if you work with a corner cube, it can move large dynamic displacement with resolution of lambda over 2. And this is simply given by counting the jump, so the derivative of this signal. Okay? Okay, we will continue next time. Uh, 
um, some student brought me about uh, the Preappello. Uh, who is the student? Is he here? He's not even here. Okay, and he is asking in the name of also other students two things, if possible. Uh, first thing is if we can consider uh, the Preappello uh, not as an alternative to the first appello, but as an alternative to any appello. So you can do preappello on the 20th of December, and then you can even choose if doing the first appello in January, whatever, or the second in February. Uh, this really means to have an extra appello, and you choose what you want. You choose December, first date, you choose the first date of January, or you choose the second date of January. It means you have three dates and you choose what you want. I hope you can understand this is not uh, correct, absolutely. The second requirement, in theory, is not very correct, the same to say yes, but it's understandable that it is your first exam. What is the second question? Second question is, can we start the prepello? look at the classwork? look and start it, half an hour is asking, and then we decide we are doing well, we are not doing well, if we are not doing well and we go away, we don't give the class, uh, um, then can we still use both appello in January? Uh, of course this is not possible if you do the whole exam and then you choose what is better between this and the other one, but considering that it is your first exam, considering that you don't look at exam classwork, even if I tell you do it, do it before, for me this is not so, uh, so bad a requirement. Maybe we can accept this. You can register. It, it means that if you register to, because we will write some registration, maybe Doodle, if you register to Prepello, it does not mean you give up one of the two appellos. It means you can come and you can change your mind, okay? You can look at it and you can change your mind. This I can accept. The other thing, I'm sorry, I cannot accept because it means that you have two dates, one on the 20th of December and another one, I don't remember the date, but it's already published, maybe I already told you. Oh, no, it must be 16th of January, something like that. And then there is another one on the 9th of February and you cannot really choose. I do one and two very close together. You have one between 20 of January or 16 of January. Uh, sorry, 20 of December or 16 of January. You choose one of the two, and if you come to Prepello and eventually you understand you have to study more, you have all Christmas vacation, and you can give up, but if you come and uh, to, to Prepello, then you cannot choose uh, to uh, the, the first date is gone anyway. If you come, sorry, and uh, deliver the class, okay? Professor, uh, for the formulas will be provided, you need to memorize. You need to memorize the photos. In case you really don't remember one, but you have the idea of the formula, you can come and ask, and I will try to help you. So it's without textbooks and we 